super vague. Um, and for us as librarians and information professionals, I say this all the time, it's just data. We've always worked with data. We're excellent at doing that. So the real thing about big data that distinguishes it from all the data that we've worked with in the past is the format in a lot of ways. So there's server log files for every action undertaken by every employee in an organization. There's social media content like Facebook and Twitter. There's digital images, which can be anything from Instagram to security camera images that we see. Uh, and there's cameras that are just everywhere nowadays, um, police security, et cetera. There's smartphone geospatial location data. Then there's Internet of Things data. And Internet of Things, that's another term like big data. What the heck is Internet of Things? It's just sensors, that's what it means. But they're everywhere, from vending machines to the subway to the highways, sensors are everywhere. Then there's personal security data. And this can be something like Nest. If you've heard of that, they make remote control security systems, smoke alarms, carbon monoxide detectors, uh, HVAC systems for homes where you can set your heating or air conditioning remotely, or personal security data like something like the Department of Homeland Security's Trusted Traveler Program. Does anyone participate in that? No one. <laughs> okay, I do. Oh, oh, one person back there. Okay, great. So what it is is you give up everything, all of your data, you agree to be fingerprinted, you submit to an interview at the airport, and then you're given an expedited process through customs when returning to the country after traveling abroad. So, big data. There's video, and at my job we always call video the genie in the bottle, because as reference librarians, we're always sort of looking for things from the past that people are looking for. So if you think about the amount of videos that are uploaded, even just say today, and then if you think five years from now, if we were looking for a video from today, that's gonna to be really hard to find, and it's really a challenge that we're going to be facing in the future because there isn't right now a great way to find things like that. Then there's the data that used to just be dropped on the floor. <laughs> Nobody paid attention to it, now it's being compiled and stored. The Garfler Group characterizes big data by the five Bs. So there's the volume, just the sheer amount that's being collected. Then there's the velocity or the speed at which the data is being created. Um, we hear often that Twitter's the new newswire. There's no lag time anymore. I was just reading about a fire that was on Twitter a half an hour before any news outlets had picked it up. It's just super fast, there's no lag time. There's the variety or all the formats that I just talked about. And then there's the two Bs that I think are the real opportunities for us as librarians and information professionals. And the first one is verification. Is the data from a quality source? Is it reliable? Is it uncorrupted? And then there's value. And in determining value, there's really three components to that. It's challenging because how do we know the data is relevant and uncorrupted and something that we want to look at? Just because it's being collected doesn't mean it's valuable for anything. It's expensive because if organizations are hiring programmers, putting infrastructure into place, and undertaking the data initiatives, that's very costly. And the return is unclear because it's very risky. Um, when you think about what you have to do to create a big data product, do you finally own that in the end? Right now, the U.S. Copyright Office refers to a Supreme Court decision in Vice versus Rural Telephone, which said that creativity has to be applied to information for it to be copyrightable. Now, that's easy to understand when you're thinking about text, but when you're thinking about data, what's creative with data? So I don't think a single download of a single data point is probably copyrightable. So organizations might be undertaking huge big data initiatives and then not even own what's, what's been created. I want to talk about some big data projects just in the context of the industries in which they were done. Uh, and these, I think, are the most valuable, not only for the return on the dollars that were spent, but also on the quality of life for people in general. Healthcare is an area where we see that a lot. Uh, doctors at Stanford Medical Center undertook a big data project where they wanted to look for combinations of drugs when taken together that produced a side effect in patients that were not seen in people just taking one of the drugs. So this was a 
several pronged approach to this. The first thing they did was go to the Food and Drug Administration's adverse drug reactions database and looked for people with side effects with drugs they were taking. They determined that there was an antidepressant and a cholesterol-lowering drug that, when taken together, was producing side effects of high blood sugar in people who weren't just taking one of them. So they worked at Stanford, they looked at medical records at Stanford University Hospital. They found eight people who were taking these two drugs who also experienced these side effects. So they thought, okay, eight people, we need to get some more people. They looked at records from medical centers all over the country. They got more people taking these two drugs, experiencing the side effect. But then it got really interesting and big data like. So they thought, let's see what people are searching for on the internet and how that might relate to this. So they partnered with Microsoft. The search engine that they used was Bing, and they looked at over 81 million searches. So that's big data. None of us on our own could look through 81 million searches to see what people are looking for. They looked for people searching for the name of the cholesterol-lowering drug, the name of the antidepressant, and then other terms like hyperglycemia, high blood sugar, blurry vision. They found people who were doing all these searches. And they thought, okay, let's see how often they're looking for all those terms. And they found out that 30% look for all those terms in the same day and 40% in the same week. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's definitely a signal that people are looking for all these terms. There must be a correlation of some kind. Kimberly Clark is the maker of Kleenex brand facial tissues, and they had a big data project called Myachu. Now, Frank was talking about Google Blue Trends. Google Blue Trends predicts, well, it doesn't predict anything. It tells you where blue is occurring right now. Myachu purported to predict blue weeks in advance by zip code. So you type in your zip code, and it tells you when the blue will be hitting that zip code. Uh, they thought they were pretty accurate with this. So the interesting thing about it was they looked at myriad of data. So Google Blue Trends looks at um, Google searches. They looked at first centers for disease control data, also things like this, social media discussions, weather and air travel patterns, over-the-counter drug sales, and then, quote, major public events that could increase transmission opportunities. So things like Super Bowl, Winter Olympics, March Madness, things like that. And they said that they could predict blue by zip code weeks in advance using this data. So you might be thinking, well, that's very nice. I can know if the flu might be headed my way. Why does Kimberly Clark care about this? Well, they seem to think that people who know the flu is coming towards them will buy tissues. So they use that data to unveil coupons, marketing campaigns, <laughs> advertising, everything like that, and they, they believe that that is effective for their business. Transportation is another area where we see a lot of really interesting big data products. I live in Chicago, and I was reading recently in The Economist, which is a British publication, they said, only drunks drive in a straight line in Chicago. Everyone else swerves to these products, and I can tell you that's probably true. Uh, but in Boston, they have an iPhone app called Street Bump, which uses big data to locate potholes using an iPhone and send those locations to the city to dispatch the road crews to come and fix the potholes. But this is very sophisticated because if your car hits a bump, it might not be a pothole. It could be a manhole cover, it could be a speed strip. So it's highly tweaked with the phone's accelerometer on the Z-axis. They use other filters to make sure it really is a pothole. Car hits the pothole, city gets the location, road crews come and fix it. Hopefully this works, and in Chicago, you have to call your alderman <laughs> to have them fixed, so sounds good to me. Um, and, and I don't want to get into the downsides of big data too much in this presentation, because we could start with personal security, spiral down from there, it could be a three-day conference just on that. But with something like this, I just want to mention, it really illustrates the digital divide that exists between people who are technologically savvy and people who aren't, because when you think about this, if you have to have a smartphone and be driving and participating with this app to have these potholes fixed, people who are technologically not plugged in are not going to be doing that. And it's not even just people who live in poverty. It could be someone like my mom. She has a car, she has a smartphone, but I don't think she would probably participate in, in this program. So when you think about a municipal program, 
it's supposed to be, be evenly applied, first come, first serve, but when you have something like this, people who have a smartphone and are clued in are, are being the first to come and the first to serve. So I just want to throw that out there because it really shows, I think, the marginalization that we can get into sometimes with these types of things. Um, how many people have ever received a parking ticket? Okay, some of us. How many people tried to fight that ticket? <laughs> okay, well, they say that up to 50% of parking tickets are thrown out when challenged. Fixed is an iPhone app that can help you try to beat your ticket. And this is how it works. This is really crazy. So you get the parking ticket, you take a picture of it with your phone, you upload this to the fixed website. Then they run it through their algorithm to try to give you back a percentage chance that you would win if you tried to fight it. <laughs> so now this is what they have in this algorithm. It's highly tweaked towards municipality. So where the ticket's written, they have all the city code accounted for in this algorithm. And also things like this, improperly posted or hidden signage, signage posted outside the allotted time frame, or wording that does not conform to statute, incorrectly documented VIN or license plate numbers, and then tickets written for violations prohibited on days other than when the ticket was written. So like it says no parking on Thursday, but you park there on a Tuesday. So it runs it through the algorithm, gives you the percentage chance that you can beat it, and then if you decide to go for it and try to fight it, fixed will send a letter on your behalf to the city contesting the ticket, and if you beat the ticket, you have to pay them 25% of the original fine. And they say that uh, they can increase your chances of beating it to a third to over 50%. So, might want to try that. <laughs> Entertainment is an area where big data initiatives can seem a little bit like Big Brother or really cool, depending on your perspective. Um, how many of you have ever been to a Disney park, Disney World, Disneyland, Eurozy, a lot of us, right? Um, I was actually just recently in Albuquerque, and I was saying to my husband, there's a lot of visitors here. And he said, yeah, they seem to be a lot of international visitors. And I thought, yeah, because we all are to Disney World, <laughs> and, and it's for the magic. It's the magic that the magical experience that they give to you. And they are upping the magic big time with a new project called My Magic Plus. And what My Magic Plus is are sensor wristbands that you wear that have your credit card information on them. Uh, so you can buy food, souvenirs, uh, it's your park admissions ticket, it's your hotel room key if you're staying at a Disney property hotel, it's your fast pass, which are assigned times for rides that you don't have to wait. And so what they're selling to adults with this really is convenience, right? Because you don't need to bring anything with you if you're wearing this wristband. You might want to bring hand sanitizer, but, but um, it, it, you, that's it. It does everything for you. But for children, it's, it's a little different even more because for kids, what they like about Disney are the characters. They like to interact with the characters. That's what's magical for them. So previously, where Cinderella might have said, hello there, little girl, with My Magic Plus, she might say, hello there, Sophia. I hear you have a birthday today. And so you can imagine how magical that would be for little Sophia on her birthday. So that's what they're giving to us with this program, but the real winner is Walt Disney because they're gonna know every move you make if you're wearing the sensor. When you went to the park, if you left and came back, what you ate, what you bought, what rides you went on, if you went to the daytime parade but not the nighttime parade, if you went back to your hotel, what time you came back, and they're gonna use all of that information to tweak their marketing strategies going forward. I don't watch a lot of sports on TV, but people who do tell me that the biggest challenge with that is deciding what to watch because all the games are on at the same time. And RUWT is an acronym that stands for Are You Watching This? It's a big data application that constantly analyzes streams of sports data to alert people to change the channel to something that matches their interests. So this is how this, this algorithm works. It rates games based off exciting things, like lead changes over time, no hitters, things like that. Then it matches that up with input from their user panel of what they call 25,000 superfans. And they rate the games as okay, good, hot, or epic. Now, this is big data, because when we think about a big data algorithm, it's not equally weighing everything. Some things are considered more important than others. 
So what are you watching this? Fans of teams like Chicago Cubs, New York Yankees, Dallas Cowboys, they're extremely loyal. So their data is way less important than somebody of, who's a fan of a team that might be seen as more objective. So that's, that's how that works. But what's really interesting about this is it affects three really disparate groups of people. Because there's us, we might be watching a Law & Order rerun, and are you watching this says, hey, your alma mater's going into overtime. Then there's sports bar owners, because if people are eating and drinking and watching sports on TV, and there's nothing on, when they're done, they're gonna leave. But if the sports bar owners know there's a crazy game on, they can put that on, people will stay, they'll keep eating, they'll keep drinking, they'll keep spending money. And then there's the telecommunications industry, because you might have heard of cutting the cord, which is uh, something that's happening a lot now. People who have cable or satellite are dropping that for things like Netflix, Hulu, web-based streaming services. And so if something is live and people know it's on, they might want to watch it live and they might be less likely to cut the cord. But sometimes big data projects hit a snag. The data might be corrupted. Uh, it might not answer the question we're trying to answer. It might be coincidence rather than causation. This is a cartoon from The New Yorker, and she's saying, I'd like to meet the algorithm that thought we would be a good match. <laughs> um, so there have been some big data busts out there. Google Blue Trends, I know Frank was talking about it. I think he was a fan, and I hate to throw cold water on that, but in January of 2013, Google Blue Trends said that 6% of America was experiencing flu. But at the same time, the Centers for Disease Control said that 11% of the U.S. was experiencing flu. Whoa, <laughs> I mean, being off by 5% is a lot. As, as a research librarian, if we were doing something and we were off by 5%, we might get fired. That's pretty bad. So how could it have been so wrong? Um, Centers for Disease Control data on flu is rock solid. It's doctors reporting flu. <coughs> Whereas Google's flu data comes from people searching in Google. And these are the kinds of things they looked at. People looking for terms like this. Tissues, cough syrup, what is the difference between a cold and the flu, news articles on flu. I don't know about that one. We're starting to see also now with sporting events where coaches make odd choices. In the Super Bowl this past <laughs> Super Bowl, this coach of Seattle, people were wondering what the heck he was thinking. And there was a really famous game with the University of Alabama where there was a tied game. They had 40 yards to go. So the coach, Nick Saban, from the University of Alabama, so we had, these were the choices he had. You could have the quarterback kneel and force overtime. You could try for a really long field goal kick. Hail Mary pass to the end zone, hope for a touchdown. So what he decided to do was go for a 57-yard field goal. <laughs> okay, kick fell short, Auburn caught the ball, three and four touchdown, game over. So the ESPN analysts watching this were saying, oh my gosh, what could he possibly have been thinking to do something like that? So they asked him, and he said that the reason why he did it was that NFL kickers make the kick from that distance 36 to 38% of the time. Whoa, okay, as, as librarians and information professionals, we would know that's not apples to apples, that's apples to oranges. Here you have people in college, and you're looking at professional athletes' data. And then furthermore, in, in the NFL, the people taking the kicks are the ones who are good at doing it. So now you have people in college and you're comparing them with professional athletes who are experts at what they do. Ouch. How many people have heard of Target Gate? Okay, I, yeah, it was a very widespread reported thing. There was a Target store in suburban Minneapolis and a father came in and asked to speak with the store manager, and he said, why are you sending coupons for diapers and infant formula to my daughter? She's a sophomore in high school. Are you trying to get her pregnant? So, so the Target store manager said, I'm really, really sorry. We do have this pregnancy predictor algorithm where we feel like we know which of our customers are pregnant. We must have screwed up in your situation. Sorry, sir. And so the guy left. Then a couple weeks later, the store manager called him again to apologize, but the father said, actually, it's me who owes you an apology. There were some activities going on in my house I wasn't aware of, and my daughter actually is pregnant. 
Okay, I've gone on the record with this before and I'll do it again. I totally think this is made up. I know it was the front page, it was the cover of the New York Times Magazine, but we don't know who the store manager was, we don't know what store, we don't know who this father was, and Target has absolutely no incentive to review this because it makes their algorithm look so good. Uh, but afterwards, it came out that the Target al algorithm, it looks at the baby registry to try to predict who's pregnant, but also things like they thought that people who buy a lot of hand lotion are probably in their second trimester of pregnancy. <laughs> um, then people were saying that everyone was getting the same coupons. There were coupons for diapers, but there were also things that wouldn't be appropriate for someone who was pregnant, like wine glasses. So are they sending everyone the same coupons because they know the algorithm isn't that good? Or is it just because sometimes when you're in a life circumstance that's on your mind, it's weighing heavily on you, and so are people thinking, oh wow, look at diapers, and I'm pregnant, they know I am. <laughs> Who knows, but I, I just don't think it's true. I think it's an urban myth, and I'm sticking with that story. <laughs> um, when the finish line of the Boston Marathon was bombed in 2013, the FBI launched a massive manhunt. They went down the sidewalk, 12 block radius with tweezers, picking up everything that they could, tagging it, bringing it to a warehouse to store. They were going to look at everything. Uh, that was the big data. As an alternative, they also went to FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia. They took 129 analysts and said, you are going to look at 13,000 video feeds and 120,000 still photographs by hand. And this is what we want you to look for somebody watching the finish line of a race that doesn't look like everyone else. And one analyst with one iPhone photo had the aha moment and said, here it is, everyone's looking to the left in the direction of the bombing, but white baseball cap is looking straight ahead. And that's the person who was arrested, tried for the crime, and convicted. And when I talked about this at SLA in Vancouver, a friend of mine, maybe he's not really a friend for this, but he raised his hand and said, how is that a big data bust? It's not really a big data bust, but it's an alternative to big data. Because the big data in this situation were things like DNA on windowsills, the sensors in the subway, the swipes, who was in and out of the Boylston Street subway stop, which was right by the finish line. They looked at pressure cooker data, because you might remember the bombs were built inside pressure cooker. So they looked at cooks and mortar data from cooks.com, amazon.com, bricks and mortar data from stores, people's credit card receipts who bought pressure cookers, and they had all of that data and were looking at it, and in the end it was the small granular data, one photo by one analyst that cracked that case. I attended a conference on data not too long ago, and it was very, very helpful to me because every speaker highlighted some of the pitfalls that we see when working with data. And it was interesting because the speakers were all non-librarians. The audience was all librarians. <laughs> so it was a really interesting dynamic going on. So speaker number one was talking about citation algorithms. He was completely obsessed with this. He said, if you just find whatever article is cited the most in any body of knowledge, that's the gold standard. That's the best article there is out there. So we had 12 to 15 different algorithms. He's showing us how you calculate how many times something was cited. but. He completely missed the point that just because something's cited a lot doesn't mean that that's the best article in the field of knowledge. It could be it's cited all the time because people keep saying, don't look at this one, this is all wrong, faulty data, or something like that. The next speaker said, just keep reusing your data. Why reinvent the wheel? Why buy it again? Just keep reusing it. And okay, that's fine, except every time you reuse data, the potential for it to become corrupted goes higher and higher. Final speaker of the day, not a librarian, he had this kumbaya moment where, where he said, what we really need is global data sharing. Let's just have one website where the whole world can upload their data and we'll all share it. And someone in the audience, a librarian, raised his hand and said, when we're doing things like this, sharing data, our biggest concern always is garbage in, garbage out. And if you're doing what you just described, how do you prevent garbage in? 
The raw data quality checklist is something we can use to ensure that our data is clean, asking ourselves these questions, but it's also great to use when we're working with our constituents who have a data project. So reminding them of these questions, because a lot of times they seem obvious to us, but the people that we're working with haven't thought about it at all. So things like, where did you get the data? How was it compiled? Are there errors or duplicates? Is it incomplete or sporadic? Is it in usable format? Formulas to use, to use to analyze it? And then there's two really tough questions, and no one wants to ask these, but I think as a librarian, we have an obligation to ask them, and that's, did you consider alternative data sources? And if you did, did you discard the alternatives because they might have revealed complicating or surprising results? If that's the case, suggest other data for them to use. And then the second question is, what biases are inherent in the interpretation? Was the data selected because it was likely to provide the expected answer? We have to make sure there isn't a twist on the old, if all else fails, manipulate the data thing going on with people's data products. The Big Data Communications Framework is a template that I created for taking a big data or regular data project from start to finish. So first, understanding what they're trying to find out what data do you need? Where will you get it? Which data out of the possibilities is the most valuable? Formulating the hypothesis, so proving things, disproving things, what you think might be the case, what ended up not being the case, so the why and the how, and not just the how many. And then communicating the business impact of the results. A great way to do that is through a data visualization. And I'm gonna talk about six data analysis tools that anyone can use. These create visualizations. And just keeping in mind though, how is a data visualization different from say a graph that we all worked with in fourth grade? Well, data visualizations are the beginning of telling a story with data. The physical space needs to communicate the relationship that your data is showing. And I just wanna offer a caveat from my own experience know your audience when making a data visual because there, right now we read a lot about interactive data visuals, bells and whistles, clickable data, it's changing in real time. I think there are a lot of people who like things like that, but if you're working in a corporate or law firm environment, they might not want to get involved with the data. Your constituents might just want to see what the data shows in, in one visual, so know your audience. So just to go through these quickly, most of these are visualization tools, but one is truly a predictive tool. So I'm gonna go through the visualization tools quickly and then get to the predictive one. So Google Fusion Tables, this creates an interactive map of occurrences. This is Academy Awards by Country. Infogram, this is my favorite data visual of all time. Uh, you enter data and it makes a chart. You can choose the kind you want. This is the number of bad guys killed by Rambo. Shirt on, shirt off in the movie it was in. Many eyes makes the word cloud. Statwing, you upload data, check variables of concern, and it plots the relationship. This is colleges and how much they cost and how many people go there. Tableau Public, this creates comparison charts between two uploaded data sets. This is hospitals and how many beds are available there and the cost per case. Then the truly predictive tool that I'm talking about is called Big MF, and it consists of four pieces. You need a source and a data set. You choose one of their algorithmic models to run your data through, and then it gives you a prediction for the future. So this example is historical ratings of countries by the big ratings agencies, so S&P Movies and Fitch. You take that to Big ML, choose one of their algorithms, and then they give you a prediction that looks like this. And this is S&P ratings for those countries uh, going into the future. Anytime you can offer a story rather than reciting statistics, your data is much more persuasive and powerful. Um, Brendan Howley was a keynote speaker at Internet Librarian Conference last fall. If you've ever been, has anyone ever been to Internet Librarian? Yeah, it's awesome, right? People have been there, um, and I can't recommend it enough. It's really fantastic. And he said, value is where data meets storytelling. And as librarians, we're awesome at telling stories. So that this is our thing that, that we're good at doing. And if you're not sure how to tell your story, I, that, you know, how do you represent the data quickly in a way that resonates with people, I would say start with a bold statement. Uh, just as an example, last fall I was involved with a charity project where we were trying to cycle 
run or walk a million miles in the month of October for childhood cancer. So we had to ask for donations and we could have recited a lot of statistics about pediatric cancer, but instead we just said a million miles might sound like a lot, but it's only 60 miles for every child that will be diagnosed with cancer in the US this year. So I had to scientists how to get hired. I don't think that you need to know how to do computer programming to work with data, to work in data science, but it helps to know a little. And just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all of these programs, but my PowerPoint's up on the website for the conference, and these are all free or very low cost pro programs where, that you can sign up for and learn some basic coding skills. Some new big data roles that I see for information professionals are a data policy expert, writing the data policy for an organization, a data release expert, letting people know when data is released and where it's from and what they can use that for, an exit survey on data expert, so in the knowledge management area, talking to people about their data and where they keep it and what it can be used for and how to share it amongst others in the organization. And then something I just heard about this two weeks ago, a new, a new field, <laughs> algorithm accountability reviewer. Now who would be better than that than us, right? Because what that is, an organization's like hiring people to do this, looking at the results after the programming's done and the data is processed to see, is this algorithm working properly? Or is it giving skewed results? That's something we would be great at doing. I actually was just a judge recently for the Software and Information Industry Cody Awards. And the category that I judged was best big data solution. I judged seven products, seven data platforms. None of them required any programming knowledge. If you wanted to see the script behind what it was doing, like you could click on an R and it would show you the R script, but you didn't need to know how to program. So I don't think that that is that critical, but like I said, it, it helps to be familiar. Internet of Things just means sensors. I used to say it meant deliberately play sensors, but then I thought, that doesn't make any sense because all sensors are deliberately placed. We're not just tossing up sensors and seeing where they land. But I was reading about Caterpillar Company. They're the makers of big earth moving equipment and they're gonna put a sensor in every forklift that they make. So if anything goes wrong with that, every person involved with that will be notified from the engineer that designed it to the people on the assembly line that put it together to the salesperson. And with Internet of Things, I think what's really interesting is we're always talking about what's the monetary value of data, all this data that's being collected, what is it really worth in real terms and real dollars? And Internet of Things data is helpful to try to determine that because Nest, as I said at the beginning, they make security systems for homes. Google bought Nest for $3 billion. And I thought that was really telling because Obviously, Google doesn't think these sensors are worth $3 billion. They think data on human behavior is worth $3 billion. It's a crazy amount. And I was reading now that Nest is partnering with Virgin Atlantic Airlines, and they're going to make these customized heating and, and cooling systems for each, each uh, chair in the airplane, each seat. So, and it's cutesy, it's sweet to places where they fly. So, like, if you're hot, you could say, I'd like a Chicago polar vortex and it'll blast you with cold air, and you can control the temperature of your seat, but as a bigger issue, so then does Nest and therefore Google know all of our data about where we're traveling and what planes we're taking and where we're sitting on the plane and what else we're doing? Did we buy something to drink while we were on the plane with our credit card? Are they gonna have that data? Who knows, it, it just seems really like a big unknown at this point and something that we need to keep in mind. But the Financial Times has this, I just want to throw this out here, how much is your personal data worth calculator? And I encourage you to look at this because the questions it asked are so revelatory as far as what data is valuable. Because the reporter that wrote about this, his data was worth $1.50. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try this. So I was completely worthless. My data was worth 30 cents. And I could just tell when it was asking the questions, I would be worthless to these people. Because the questions were like, are you looking to buy a house? Are you looking to buy a car? Do you have kids that are going to college? Do you have elderly parents that might need elder care? But check it out because the, when you read the questions, you really get an idea of what data is valued. Affectiva is software that combines machine learning with a digital image database 
to try to decode human emotions and then therefore sell things. Um, this is, so this is how it works. It has a sensor that you strap to your palm and it measures uh, your temperature, your heartbeat, things like that. Then there's a webcam that's focused on you, that's looking at you. That combines with Affectiva's facial recognition software. Now this is big data because they scan 80,000 furrowed brows to try to figure this thing out. Uh, so it combines all these things and it supposedly reads your emotions and puts that onto your phone. Eight to 10 times an hour because that's the average amount of times people check their phone. Um, so why would this thing be something? Well, it's for advertising because advertisers believe that emotional people are more energetic and more engaged and more likely to buy things. So they are frantically trying to find people who are emotional and, and this kind of thing would do that. Uh, but it, I was thinking about this and I thought, okay, let's say you're wearing a Fitbit. Does anyone have one of those that measures how many steps you take? Yeah, a lot of people do. So let's say you're wearing that and you have Affectiva and it's reading your emotions and it's hooked up to your phone, which has your work outlook calendar. Are you gonna get something that says, oh, I see you have a meeting with your boss today, and the last time you had a meeting with your boss, your heart rate went up, you might wanna take a few deep breaths, and then if your work owns that iPhone, is the HR department seeing this? I mean, who knows? I was just thinking. It, the same thing with automobile insurance. I have State Farm, and they're always sending me letters. You're a safe driver, take one of our sensors, and we'll lower your rates because we'll track how safe you drive. But also, automobile insurance industry thinks that angry equals three beers. So now if, if these sensors somehow say that you're angry, are your rates gonna go up? Hard to say. Has anyone ever heard of the Mary Tyler Moore episode, Chuckles Bites the Dust? Okay, a few people have. Yeah, um, it, it's one of the most watched episodes in the history of the series. Chuckles the Clown was the host of a children's program at the station where they all worked. And Mary Richards, played by Mary Tyler Moore, was always sort of the fall woman for everyone else's antics and shenanigans. But Chuckles died, and when they told her that he died, she couldn't stop laughing. And everyone else was just horrified that, that she thought this was funny. Um, but you know, we've all been there, inappropriate laughter. My dad always called it getting in a laughing jag. Um, you know, laughter can mean anything. It can mean empathy, discomfort with violence, awkwardness, who knows? But now we have software that's gonna say how we feel. I would never guess how someone feels or what they're thinking, but software is gonna tell us this. I don't know about that. So I think it's really another role for us, interviewing people. If there are companies that want to actually capture this information, at least we need an algorithm accountability reviewer to make sure people are, that the software's really reading how people feel. Just, just uh, you know, we hear all the time data's the new oil, but people just need gasoline. They need something refined that's packaged and processed and ready to go. Or put another way, Eric Schmidt from Google said, data is the sword of the 21st century, and those who analyze it well will be the samurais. He didn't say those who program it well, he said those who analyze it well, and we can analyze it well, and we'll be the samurais. I did write a book about big data for librarians, it's The Accidental Data Scientist. If you are so inclined, you can buy it here for 40% off at the exhibit hall, and I talk a lot about different big data projects and how to take them from start to finish and other data tools as well. So thank you so much, computers and libraries.